Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. In case you don't know who I am, my name is John. Uh, I'm a member of the church here. And it's a great honor of mine to be able to speak uh, this morning. It's been a wonderful morning, hasn't it, together so far in the presence of God. Um, I don't know about you, but so often I just turn up to church and I try to get myself G'd up. A little bit like Doreen was saying, we kind of get into performance mode. And then you get here and you realize again, no, 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 I don't need to perform for anyone. I don't even need to perform for God. Um, I am covered by his grace. He loves me. As Reese was saying, we are his sons. We are his daughters. He loves us. And it's so wonderful when we come together just again to hear so many words expressing God's love, God's heart for us here again today. He's, he's the God who sings over us. He's the God who loves us. He speaks to us all the time. He's never quiet over our lives. He's always encouraging us as a church family. Amen. It's wonderful to be part of a church like this. And it's my, again, my honor to be able to carry on from where Reese left off so superbly last week, looking at Colossians chapter three. We've been going through the whole book of Colossians. We're now in chapter three, which is all about how God changes us. How does God change us? But to start, before I get into these words, I'd just like to ask us this question, which is, have you ever been shocked by anyone's testimony before? Have you ever been shocked by someone's story before? You know what I mean? Where someone, that they, so someone shares and what they're saying about their former lives is so different to who they are now today in God. You see, I remember going to um, a pastor's conference in Cambodia, probably about 10 years ago now. Um, I didn't know anyone at this conference. I was there just as a visiting speaker. And I turned up and um, I think this one old guy, probably about 80 years old, uh, took pity on me, became my friend very quickly. He gave me lunch. He looked after me for the whole day. The most gentle soul probably I've ever met. He kind of told me a little bit about his family. He was asking me about my family. And I didn't realize that that evening, this guy would be the guest speaker. And uh, all he did when he spoke was share about his life story. This little old 80-year-old guy sharing about what God had done in his life. And I just remember being staggered as he opened his mouth and he shared about 50 years ago or something before he became a Christian, he was a commander in the Khmer Rouge uh, army. Uh, if you don't know what that is, that's the Communist Party in, in Cambodia during the Civil War. He was a commander. And really he was sharing how he had an incredibly horrific reputation for the way that he, he sadly tortured people and ordered the execution of thousands of people in the places that he would go to. That was his job, that was his life for year, year after year. And uh, I just remember being speechless, just listening again to this, again, this gentle guy that I'd just been speaking to, telling about this horrific past that he had had. And, and then he just shared this beautiful thing about how he had then, once he became a Christian, felt called by God to go back to these towns, back to these villages, to declare who Jesus is, to plant churches, serving those that he once persecuted. I remember being undone in that moment. And for me, it was just a massive illustration, again, of what God does in our lives. I just could not reconcile the two people, who this guy used to be and who he is now in Jesus. And that's what we're going to be looking at again today, that no matter who you are, no matter how dark your past, God's plan is to completely change your life. God's plan is to completely renew you, to make you a new person in him. No matter who you are, I don't care what you've done, what your past is, this is God's plan for your life. And that's what we're going to see in this passage today in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to share the first five verses that Reese looked at last week, and then I'm going to go beyond that to verse 11. So we're going to start at verse 1, where Paul says this. He says, If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
For you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Syrian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Again, through these words today, we're going to be looking at the question, how does God change us? And you see, immediately we need to get rid of any notion that change comes into our lives as we try harder. You see, this is one of those passages that I think should really come with a big warning sign. And the sign should really say, under all circumstances, do not do this in your own strength. Do not do this in your own strength. Because at first glance, that is what these words kind of look like. It sounds like Paul is saying, put to death these things in your life and you'll be okay. But actually what we need to remember is that Paul is assuming that when we get to Colossians chapter 3, we've read Colossians chapter 1 and 2, which seems fair enough, right? We read the whole letter. And we've got to remember that chapter 2 ends with Paul saying this. I just want to put these words up on the screen behind me. It's Colossians chapter 2 coming up. Any second now? There you go. If you then have been raised with... Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's today. Next one. Keep going. Chapter two, I can just read it off my note. There you go. Since you died with Christ, see the ele elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of their body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. I hope we hear this this morning. Human commands, teachings, rules, regulations. In other words, anything that we do, any activity we do in our own strength is powerless to change us. Paul says it lacks any value. You see, I wonder, have you ever found that the more you try to be a good Christian, the more you seem to fail? The more you try to just play around with your behavior, trying to be and sound and look like a Christian in your own strength, the more you seem to fail. You know, my life is littered with examples like this. And actually, there's a common theme in my life. And one thing that happens actually more than I'd like it to, which is on my way here to church on Sunday mornings. You see, I've kind of set myself this command, which says something along these lines, which is I've got to be here early, right? Because that's what good Christians do. They serve others. They get here to worship, to pray early, to help other people when they arrive. But you see, what happens to me is that when I do eventually get here, I'm the one that needs help. Because I've literally dragged my whole family kicking and screaming across town, getting them up out of bed early to get here on time. And when I get here, I've lost my voice from shouting at them to get in the car. They're upset with me for being upset with them. Kate's upset with me for being upset with the kids. Right? And she's upset with me for driving like a maniac through town to get here on time. That's often what happens, isn't it? When we try in our own strength to be a good Christian. We end up a million miles away from where we want to be. Puritan writer, 
uh, an old dude called John Flavel. He puts it like this. He said, we are more able to stop the sun in its course or make rivers run uphill with our own skill than have power to rule and order our own hearts. I say that again, we are more able to stop the sun in its course or make rivers run uphill by our own skill than have power to rule and order our hearts. You see, we may be able to change things out here outwardly, how we look, how we sound, but actually this stuff is powerless to change what really matters, which is our hearts. What's in here? And this was the problem with the church in Colossae. They were attempting really the impossible. In their desire to look and sound like Jesus, which is a, a good desire, they were though adding rules and rituals, systems, extra teachings to their faith in order to change themselves. In other words, they were trusting God, yes, to save them, but not to transform them. And we've got to be aware that legalism like that is still in the church today. Legalism is still around today. You see, I've yet to meet a Christian who admits they're a legalist. Have you? <laughs> I, I've yet to meet anyone who sets out to be a legalist. But if we're honest, actually legalism, it affects us all. It seeps into our lives before we know it a lot of the times because it's so attractive. So attractive. If you think about it, really, legalism is very attractive because it makes holiness and change something we can manage in our lives. Think about it like that. With legalism, we can systematically organize how we change. How many of us like organizing things here? With that kind of type, right? This is what legalism does. It enables us to do it. Because when Jesus says, love God, really kind of, what does that mean? Can seem so vague sometimes. We really need to kind of, really kind of like spend time with God to figure that one out. But give me a list of 10 rules to follow. Tell me what to do and when to do it. And I'm a happy bunny, right? You can kind of schedule this stuff into your life. And legalism also brings with it a sense of achievement. It makes us feel good inside, right? It makes us feel proud. It convinces us that yes, I am saved by grace, but I am the person today because of the things that I've done. Look at my record. I've been committed to this church ever since it started. I've been a pillar of this church. I've served, I've loved, I've done everything God has asked of me. I've sacrificed day in, day out. This is what I've done. You see, legalism gives us the most incredible confidence boost in that sense. And often when we compare ourselves to other people, right? All the things that they don't do, that you do. All the ways that you committed where they haven't. And perhaps the most frightening thing about legalism is what Paul says in the passage we've just read, which is that legalism has the appearance of wisdom. They think that's scary? Has the appearance of wisdom. In other words, legalism helps you gain influence in your life. Legalism makes people listen to you and follow you because on the surface out here, it looks like you've got it all together. But really, below the surface, you are the exact same person struggling with the exact same sinful desires you always have. The only difference is that now you are way more stressed, way more anxious and frustrated trying to keep up the charade trying to keep up appearances. You see, if you notice any frustration in your life, maybe it's with yourself, maybe it's with your family, maybe it's with your church, often it comes down to legalism. It comes down to this fact that we want things to be nice and order. We want things to look good. And in stark contrast, the kind of change that God wants to bring into our lives is Guys, it's so radically different, radically different. You know, we didn't read it today, but if we went on in this, in this chapter, Paul defines God's change in our lives as an inner peace that governs our hearts. 
Let's change from the inside out, as Reese was saying last week, where we don't have to stress about the things that we do. We don't have to worry about the things that we say. We don't have to have all these filters in our heads all the time. Am I saying the right thing? Am I behaving the right way? We don't have to be constantly fearful of putting a foot wrong. We're just living out of the overflow of the peace and the love of God that's in here. That's the kind of change that God wants in all of our lives. And that's what God's doing here. Now, you would have experienced this yourselves, right? This is what it is to be a Christian. We have this peace growing inside us. And it happens the more that we let go of our own self-righteousness and we pick up more and more of who we are now in God. Paul in Colossians is clear. We've got to stop playing around, modifying our old lives when actually God wants us to mortify our lives, which is really just a posh word for putting to death our old ways, putting to death all those old ways of doing things, including how we get our confidence, including all these religious ways that we seem to act in. You see, I wonder, did any of us ever watch the program Pimp My Ride when you were younger? This is me trying to show I'm, I'm young and hip, kind of. Um, I used to love that program on MTV. I don't know whether you had it here in Canada, but essentially all it was doing was taking old, run-down, beat-up cars, giving them a new lick of paint, giving them a big uh, subwoofer in the boot, an amazing stereo, making them look like the shiniest car on the road. But really, underneath, these cars were still just useless old bangers, right? That's all it was. And that's what Paul is saying here in verse 5. He's saying, stop wasting your time polishing the old you. Why would you bother doing that? Stop living the way you were. Stop polishing it. Jesus has already given you a brand new life. If you are a Christian here today, there is already a brand new you. Why dust up this old rust bucket? You already have the new thing in Jesus. And the declaration from this platform this morning for that has been incredible. Again, who we are now in Christ. In the heavenly realms, every single one of us, if we know Jesus, is a completely different person. In verse 4, Paul says this. He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The most incredible words. You see, there is a day coming when the world as we know it will be stripped away. And in that moment, if you were to look into a mirror and fully see who God has made you to be, you would see someone perfect as Jesus is perfect, righteous, covered in Christ. You see, if today we were going to do that, right? If I was going to hold up a mirror to your face and say, this is a spiritual mirror. When you look at it, you're going to see who the real you is. I'd imagine some of us won't want to look. Like we'd be kind of scared thinking, what am I about to see? I know what I've done this week. I know how I've come here this morning. I know how I've wound up my family. But you know, if we were to really do that, we would be blinded by what we see, literally blinded by how radiant we look in Christ, how magnificent we look here this morning. We would reflect Jesus' beauty. And we would also reflect Jesus' majesty. You see, you used to be a slave to sin. This is how the Bible described us. That was our old identity. We were in chains and rags. We could not do anything but sin and give in to temptation, following the ways of the world. But in Christ, now, in the heavenly realms, we are now robed in his righteousness, in his royal robes. We are like royalty here today in Christ. And so, so often I hear Christians talk about being in chains, right? That we've got to break these chains. Actually, our chains have been broken already in Christ. We've got to stop that talk. Yes. We are free. God has broken those chains. We are no longer slaves. We're no longer prisoners to the old way. God has made us free. We have authority over sin. We can say no to temptation for the first time in our lives. We can even say no to Satan. You know, when we stand our ground, 
when we resist Satan, what does the Bible tell us? Tell us now, he flees. He flees, he goes. We just have to stand our ground. That's the authority we have. That's your new identity in Christ. It's who you are today. This is the real you. It's how the angels, the principalities, the powers and the heavenly realms see you right now. It's how God sees you right now. The only issue is this, which is this is not how we see ourselves. We don't see ourselves this way. We already have everything we need to change, but yet often we don't realise it. We don't realise what God has placed in our hands. I love Ken's word earlier about God putting a key in our hands. We don't realise we've got the keys here today. And Paul says, when it comes to how God transforms us, this is everything. It's the whole ball game. It's the simple answer to this question, how does God change us? The key is it starts in here, what we believe. It starts in here, what we think. It doesn't start out here with our activity. It's not about what we do. It's about what we believe and what we think. Just listen again to how these words, we can just put Colossians 3, the first five verses up. Just listen to how they play out again. Colossians 3 verse 1, set your hearts on the things above. Verse 2, set your minds on the things above. And at this point, we may ask, what am I to set my mind and heart on? Verse 3, set your mind on who you are now in Christ, that you are hidden with him. And then... Verse five, you will put to death your earthly nature. That's the flow. In other words, the more time you spend up there with your mind and with your heart, with God, contemplating him, spending time encountering him, the more you do that, the more we change down here. That's how we change in our lives. And these are the kind of things that we'll begin to notice in our lives the more we do this. Firstly, we'll discover that we have New desires, new you, new desires. You will find, you see, that God is so good. The more you spend time with him, he is so much better than what what we ever thought. So good that it changes everything that we run after in this life. You see, maybe you're struggling with some of the things that Paul mentions in this passage. Maybe it's stuff like sexual immorality. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's impurity. And if this is you, the key really is an abstinence. And that's kind of, again, what's that as a rule? It's a regulation. No, the key is God. The key is filling your time with God, understanding who he is, understanding again who you are. You see, there is this perception, isn't there, in the Christian life, it's all about denying yourself. But really the opposite is true. Because the more we encounter God, the more electrifying and exciting life becomes. That's that's how it is. I love how John Piper puts it. He talks about Christian hedonism, right? We've got to move from being a hedonist, running after all this stuff, to being a Christian hedonist, right? We do all this stuff. We chase after God to get all the joy from him that we can. I also love what C.S. Lewis says about this. I put the words on the screen behind me. Many of us would have heard these before. He says this, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospels, it would seem that our old, our Lord finds and desires, finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. And then he says this, we are far too easily pleased. I wonder, have we become far too easily pleased with just muddling around here on this earth? Do we understand really what's an offer to us with God? Do we get that? The point is, it's impossible to what, to live like we once used to, chasing after this stuff, if we truly tasted and seen who God is. That's how this changes us, new desires. Also what happens when you fix your eyes and fix your mind on who Jesus is and who we are, we'll notice in our lives, 
new confidence. You see, worry, anxiety, timidity, fear. These are all fruits of setting our minds on a world that either doesn't have God in it or a world where God is not in control. All of these negative emotions that we encounter, that's the root cause of it. We build God out of the equation. These things don't come out of nowhere. These come as a direct outcome of meditating really on bad theology. You know, one of my lasting memories of doing a theology degree was debating this subject, the sovereignty of God all the time, again and again and again. Is God really in control of everything and, ev and everyone? And for me back then, really, it was just an academic issue, just another thing to talk about to pass time. But this is way bigger than that. Because the truth of God's sovereignty is the key to each of us living in peace. It really is. I mean, I just want to say I was undone by listening to that song that Risa put together this morning. Um, just knowing where he wrote that song and the words of that song. Um, I wasn't planning to say this this morning, but again, it emphasizes, it emphasizes this this morning. Reese at this moment could be scared, he could be fearful, but it's just amazing to see the incredible trust and reliance that he has in God, the peace of God. Knowing that God is handling this for him, God has got him, which is what we get. The more time we spend with God, the more we understand he is in control fully in control of every circumstance, every situation. And he has got us right in the middle of it. It's like my favorite passage in the Bible is where we see the Israelites and they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? They got the, Is they got the Egyptians coming down at them. It's a huge army coming from one end. And on the other side, they got the Red Sea. And in that moment, they're what? They're angry feeling out of control. God, you've taken us this far for this to happen. And then in that moment, we're told that Moses steps up and he says this. He says, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to stand still. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to stand still. And you know, for myself, as someone who, is, who loves fighting, to be honest, like through life, this sets me free, this truth. You see, I've really, like, in my life, probably had this kind of hidden rage. I don't know if any other, anyone else can associate this. Hidden anger that's really driven me through life. Just to kind of knock down barriers, knock down walls. On the surface, it looks like stubbornness. It looks like rebelliousness. But really, if I was to rule it down, it looks like anger. Because angry is what we become when we feel like we're out of control. It's what we become when we feel scared. Angry is, the, is a sinful emotion sometimes, not always a sinful emotion, but can be a sinful emotion when we hit a brick wall. We feel like we're getting a no. and We feel like we need to force our way through. And to be honest, I have no idea where this came from in my life. I try to psychoanalyze myself time and time again, but actually it doesn't really matter. It's not where it came from that's the issue, it's where, what I do with it now. I just need it to go. I know it's not part of my heavenly nature. It's not who God has called me to be. And so actually I've learned that now I'm to put it to death by meditating on this truth that my dad, my father in heaven is completely in control. He is far more glorious and powerful than we can ever imagine. Guys, right now he has got you. I don't care what you're going through. He has got you completely and he fights for you. And over time, this has brought me such patience and calmness. I've still got some way to go. Kate will tell you that. I'm not the finished article yet. But the John that I am today is far different from the John even that I was this time last year. So often we get a bit impatient with ourselves. We want things to happen straight away. But the more we meditate on these truths, the more we change inside. And I could go on and on with things like this that God does when we set our minds and hearts on him. There's many things I could say, but I just want to land with this one, which is this, that when we do this, 
when we contemplate all these things, we also get new devotion in our lives. Because that's what happens when we experience the incredible love and grace of God for ourselves. You see, when we don't have grace in our lives, we tend to see our relationship with God as a contractual relationship, right? It's a contract between us both, me and God. I do good works and he blesses me. I give up my time to serve and God, I expect some kind of reward in return. That's often how we live our lives. It's the story of the prodigal son, just not the younger brother, but the older brother. Because we're told that when the younger brother returns to the father, the older brother is dutifully working for his dad in the fields. And when he hears that his dad is throwing a party for his younger brother, what does he do? He becomes bitter, doesn't he? Angry. He reacts to his father and he says these words. In fact, it's again, it's on the screen behind me. He says, all these years, I've been slaving for you. Do you hear those words? All these years, I've been slaving for you. No, he doesn't say, God, I've been partnering with you. My, or dad, I've been partnering with you. Or I've been working with you, dad. He says, I've been slaving away for you. All these years. And I've never disobeyed your orders. And that's the kind of faith really that Jesus warns us against, where it's all about this thing called obedience. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Do this, say that, look the parts. It's all about duty. We see it when we say things like this, when we say, I have to give, or I must go to my life group. It's what's expected of me. I must read my Bible. You know, that's not the kind of joyless life that God wants for us. That's not God's intention for us to live that kind of life. Because all that does is produce in us bitterness and resentment that then leads to things like envy and jealousy, critiquing people, tearing people down like the older brother. That is a heavy way of living. And the only way we put these things to death, that kind of living to death, is to set our minds and our hearts on the incredible love and grace of God. You see, despite the anger of the older brother, what does his father say to him? He says these words. I think it's on there. My son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. It's really the killer line in this whole parable. Jesus is just showing us again, God's wonderful heart for every one of us. He says, my son, my child, my daughter, you are always with me. Don't you know I'm never not with you? I'm always with you. Reese said these very words again earlier. I'm always with you, holding you. And do you know what? Everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. And the more we understand this, the more it changes us inside. If you've got a hard heart, you can't help but your heart being softened by these words, right? We are loved in this way. We are God's sons, God's daughters. Everything that we have is from him. He is always with us. And when we get this, you know, it changes our devotion completely. Worship stops being this dull thing. It becomes joyful. It's like what we had this morning. It's why we can start off singing and dancing and celebrating and cheering God because worship becomes this incredible declaration, a gratitude thing. It's a thankful declaration of what God has already done for us. We're not performing for him. We already have everything in him. We're just saying, God, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful thing you've done in my life. Thank you for who I am in you. And when we get this, it completely changes Christianity, changes the Christian life. It's the simpleness really of the Christian life. It's not about activity. There is nothing in the Christian life that we need to do or have to do or must do anymore. It's really all about understanding and growing in who you are in Christ and what Jesus has already done for you. We've been born again already. We are new creations in Christ, made in God's image. 
Again, Paul in verse 10, just to repeat himself, says this, we are being made new. We are now being renewed in knowledge for our minds and hearts to reflect this new reality in our lives today, to reflect the image of God, renewed in his image. And I believe, in fact, if we get out the band back, that's what God is doing right now in our midst. As we've been worshipping, this is what the God has been doing. The Holy Spirit inside us, his Holy Spirit is here within us, changing us, transforming us. And I just want to encourage us right now, just as the band get themselves ready and start playing the background, why don't we just close our eyes? And I say that not because it's a religious thing and other rule to do. I say that because actually it helps us deal with distractions. And so often we're distracted from God's voice. I believe God is speaking to everyone in this, every one of us in this room right now. He has plans, purposes that he wants to speak to us about, but also he'll be nudging us about things in our lives that he is changing right now. Things in our lives that he is working on right now. It will be, feel like a nudge. It will feel like a, a desire to do something for him. It will feel like a desire to change. It won't feel like condemnation. If it, if it feels like condemnation right now, you can shrug that off. That's not from the Holy Spirit. But the purpose of God sending his Holy Spirit to dwell with us, to dwell in us, is to change us from the inside out. And I just believe he's putting his finger on some things right now. And if you hear anything this morning, is that we wouldn't take that conviction of the Holy Spirit and run into immediately doing things for God or put into place rules and things that ways which we can change. That's not why the Holy Spirit is prodding your heart. No, the Holy Spirit is convicting us this morning because he wants to show us again the beauty of who God is. He's showing us again things that maybe we haven't grasped, <laughs> things that we haven't understood about God. The only reason why we're acting this way is because we haven't seen God in his fullness. And so I encourage us, just start to talk with God. Talk to the Holy Spirit who lives inside you. This is really how we begin to change. And I like to say things like, Jesus, show me, God, show me areas in my life that I'm not aware of that I need to change in, or you're changing in my life. God, show me the truths that I've neglected. Take me deeper into these truths that I may understand who, and I, who I already am in you. Show me again the reality of who you are. Give me an experience of your goodness that completely shapes who I am. Reveal to me these areas, Father God. These are the things that I, I'm learning to say to myself and to say to God all the time. This is Christian meditation. It's not speaking to ourselves. It's speaking to God. Speaking to God. And so, Lord, we thank you. Thank you that this morning we are not hopeless cases. Thank you, Jesus, we are far from it. As has already been declared right throughout the whole of our morning together, we have been made righteous in you. <laughs> the old has gone, the new is here. Thank you, Jesus, that we are righteous through you. There's nothing we need to do to prove ourselves anymore. And thank you, Jesus, that you made life so simple that, Lord, we just need to think about this new reality. We just need to set our hearts in it and we start to shrug off these things in our lives. And Lord, I ask that you would move through this place, that you would touch lives, touch hearts, touch every person here. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and continue to renew us in your image, Father God. We just say, come Holy Spirit. Come change me, Lord. Come change me, Lord. Just want to give you just a moment now, just speak to God. Just speak with God. Father God, pour out your spirit, Lord. Move right across your body. Jesus. Yeah. And um, we're going to sing one song to finish. 
I want to encourage us, let's keep talking to God like this as we go from here, as we go into our weeks. I think Doreen, you've got some words to bring. Where's Doreen? Oh, you're here. Great. Um, which will probably flow on the back of this, things that God is doing in our midst. And, uh, and then we'll worship.